Okay, uh, here we are, and let me uh, get us going here. I'm, my name is Kevin Koistra. I'm the, hold on a second, folks. I am locked up here. Let's see. All right, thank you so much for tuning in today on this beautiful, almost like a fall afternoon here in Billings. Uh, my name is Kevin Koister. I'm at the uh, Western Heritage Center. I'm in the basement of the Parmley Billings Memorial Library to introduce our wonderful speaker today, um, a gifted speaker, uh, storyteller Mary Jane Bradbury up in Helena today, a program that's brought to you by Humanities Montana. Uh, Mary Jane draw, draws over 30 years as an actor, speaker, educator, and author to bring history to life. Uh, before moving to Montana in 2014, Mary Jane was an interpreter and actor, reenactor, I assume, uh, for the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Her passion for history, education, and performance merged when she created her speaking business, A View of the Past, dedicated to inspiring audiences of all ages by bringing to life compelling stories from history. She has presented her unique storytelling to schools, museums, corporations, historic venues throughout the Rocky Mountain West. I think we try to bring her to the Western Heritage Center at least every other year. Often um, she is uh, portraying a character. Today she is Mary Jane Bradbury, the real person, um, <laughs> with a program called And Yet They Persisted. Uh, the History of the 19th Amendment, which uh, passed uh, in the year 1920, and I'll let her uh, take off, and I will be the chat master, uh, so if you do have questions out there, uh, the questions will be addressed uh, toward the end, uh, maybe in about 30 or so minutes, and uh, I'll click back at that point, and um, so hopefully uh, we'll uh, all be engaged in the program, and Mary Jane, thank you so yep. much joining us. Oh, thank you so much, Kevin, for having me. Thank you to the museum, to the humanities. Yes, I would much prefer being in Billings in person because these programs are, are um, a, a, an experience that we create together, the audience and the speaker, especially one like this, because it has so many, um, well, it's history, most of which took place over a hundred years ago, but is so relevant today. The things we're still navigating in our society are very much included in this story. So thank you for being with us today. Um, and yet they persisted. I wrote this program in 2019 in anticipation of 2020, which would be the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. And I had all these bookings and I actually did the program once to a live audience and then everything was shut down. So I didn't get a whole lot of airtime in person. And then we all know what 2020 was like in terms of, well, voting. And that's what this is all about, the right to vote. And other, other aspects of our society that have to do with equality. So it's, um, I thought, well, should I rewrite it, you know, change it? But no, no, the history doesn't change. How we look at the history changes. So that's what we're going to do, lay out this timeline. We'll go fast through it and just give you some stopping points to think about in terms of what this was like for the women, for the society in America at the time. Before we get started, I have a couple of definitions for you. Suffrage, in this case, allow. It means to allow, to suffer, to allow, and in this case, to allow political freedom. Uh, equality, in this case, is women wanted equal opportunity to have a voice in their government. They wanted to be seen as citizens. And uh, our purpose will be to look at the history of this amendment. A reminder too, right now, that the whole timeline of this history, print is the only medium of mass communication. There's telephone kind of towards the end of it, but it wasn't a mass communication. Print, newspapers, uh, magazines. Recording in hand. progress. Well, I've got a screen come up here that apparently I needed to address. So print is the only medium. Uh, newspapers, magazines, 
handbills, uh, little little propaganda, little uh, postcard kind of uh, handout things. Um, and of course, if print is the only medium, who is writing the articles makes a difference. What are their particular opinions? And then who is publishing them? The owners of the newspapers and the owners of the magazines, they all add into this mix of what gets reported and what gets consumed by the readers. So keep that in mind. We're up against just one kind of medium. The United States Constitution does not say that women can't vote, but it doesn't say that they can. And so that was left up to the states and every state excluded women. So the people who, who uh, started this, this uh, revolution, and it was a revolution, they were going against the laws and the customs of the time in order to say, here are people who want to be seen as equal. This is largely also a history that is uh, made and enacted by white women, white middle-class women, women of color, poor women. They were included in the overall umbrella of, of femininity, I guess you could say, but they weren't active participants. They were you know, putting food on the table. Or in the early part of this story, many were enslaved. So keep that in mind as well, because there's not a lot of equality in the telling of this story, but it got the job done so that we could build on it to the future that we have now. So, all right, let's get started here. You've heard of Seneca Falls, New York, first women's rights convention. And a lot of people put that 1848 as the beginning of the suffrage movement, but it had been going on for decades before that. So here, let's take a look, Abigail Adams, the wife of John Adams, while he was helping to craft our constitution, said, remember the ladies, because women will not feel obligated to follow laws in which they have no participation in creating. Mary Wollstonecraft wrote, the, wrote um, Vindication on the Rights of Women. It was the first feminist writing that made it into print. And in her argument, she said, you know, if women are supposed to be taking care of the home and the children and such, they'd be much better mothers and wives if they were educated. So she brought up the point that women should have equal right to education. The Grimke sisters. It was clear to many that slavery as an institution in this country was wrong. And the Grimke sisters were among the first to publicly speak. This was at a time, the 1820s, 30s, 40s, women were not supposed to speak in public. They weren't. They were seen as putting themselves on display. They were seductresses if they were speaking in public. Obviously, that was their, their point for doing it. So for a woman, and these are maybe in most people's mind, not very seductive looking women, they were out there making the point that, that slavery ought to be abolished. Um, uh, Angelina Grimke addressed the Massachusetts legislature, hoping to get them to consider the idea of abolishing slavery. And she said, we, abolish, we abolitionist women are turning the world upside down. And inspired by the Grimskys, Lucy Stone was also a staunch abolitionist, the first woman in Massachusetts to get a college degree. And she said, I will brave ridicule and persecution for the good that will come from it. In 1840, the world's uh, anti-slavery convention met in London. And Lucretia Mott was one of America's delegates to that, 1840, London. And the people in London wouldn't let women take a seat. They didn't think women should have a voice in this. And she was very upset by that. She met another woman at that conference in London, a young woman who actually was on her honeymoon, but who stopped by to see what it was all about. Her name was Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And the two of them said, look, when we get back to the United States, we need to do something about this. It was eight years before they did. In 1848, they met in Seneca Falls and they drafted, a, um, they drafted a, 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 a document that they were going to put before the delegates at this convention that they were planning. 
We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. And their demands, resolutions included the right of married women to own property, the right to leave the confines of your own home and just participate in society, the right to earn wages and keep them, the right to have custody of your children if a marriage broke apart, and the right to vote. Every one of those resolutions passed unanimously except for the right to vote, because even the 300 people who were at that convention said, if people see us put that on there, they're going to think we're crazy. But after a couple of days of discussions, it was finally passed. A couple of years after the Women's Rights Convention in Seneca Falls in 1851, Elizabeth Cady Stanton met Susan B. Anthony. And together they formed one of the most formidable alliances in the history of reform in this country. Susan, uh, Susan B. Anthony was a single woman, a school teacher. She was a great speaker. Stanton was a mother. She had children, she couldn't really travel that much, but she was a wonderful writer. And between them, and they acknowledged each other over the years, between them, Anthony could go out and do the speaking. Elizabeth could come up with the words for her to use. And they made a big difference in things. All right then. How many people, how many people have Heard the expression, well-behaved women rarely make history. Well-behaved women, not so well-behaved women, good girls, bad girls, maybe. Um, Mae West once said that it pays to be good, but it doesn't pay a lot. What did it mean to be a well-behaved woman in those days? And of course, that's what everyone would want to aspire to. Godey's Ladies Book in 1852 Defined a well-behaved woman as courteous, cheerful, polite, pious, industrious, and good-natured, moral and benevolent, avoids gossip, fault-finding, grumbling. She is not stubborn or self-centered, has good table manners, has respect for her parents. And with this, she should be able to obtain her culturally determined goal of a good marriage and motherhood. That was it. Biology was destiny. If you were a woman, that was what you were supposed to do. And of course, as I mentioned, this applied to white women, middle class, upper class white women. But didn't everybody else want to be just like them? I mean, if you were a woman, you certainly aspired to that ideal, that model. Of course, I'm being facetious because so many could never even begin to reach that level. Um, but that is that was the mindset of the time when it comes to defining what a woman should be doing. Women have no place in the public sphere, it was thought, because of her inferior physical capabilities, which are confirmed by the lack of a robust constitution. But how robust would anybody be if you were dressed in a corset that bound you inward and hung with 15 or 20 pounds of clothing. There was no opportunity for any physical robustness because you were all um, bound up with clothes and you couldn't really exercise in order to get more healthy. If women indulge in exceptional exertion, they are inclined to nervous irritability and neurasthenic disease, delicate, high strung, subject to fits of anxiety or even hysteria. Women need to avoid anxiety-producing and enervating situations, intense mental excitement, anger, grief, joy, pursuing an academic education. All of this brings further injury to the health. Women are too frail to be citizens, and their efforts, acted out rashly and foolishly, make them ultimately unfit for public life because of perilous injury brought on by the irritations of the outside world. You can imagine someone shaking their finger at you and, and lecturing you in such a way. So I talked about the clothing. The, the Chicago Tribune actually wrote an editorial that said, until a woman is allowed legs, there's no hope for her brains. 
No sane person can possibly dispute the fact that women have just as much right to leg freedom as men. For some unscrutable reason, this liberty has been denied them. All right, then. Let's look at what uh, we're talking about here. All right. 1860s. The hoop skirt. Holding those hoops that skirt out over several layers of petticoats and pantalettes and such with an hourglass figure. And one of the reasons, this is where leg freedom comes into play, is because women didn't have anatomy below the waist. As you can see, she doesn't. She doesn't have legs, uh, limbs. If you had to refer to her lower extremities, she had limbs, but this this outfit allowed her to float along angelically. Think Scarlett O'Hara across the, the, the terraces there at, um, at Terra. Just didn't acknowledge that a woman was anything but her saintly self from the waist up. In the 1870s, the hoops go away and bustles come in. The hoops kind of get pushed to the back and there's a cage, a crinoline and whalebone cage underneath the clothing with all kinds of draping fabrics. Of course, it has changed a little bit. By the 1880s, a lot of those drapes are gone and the bustle gets very, very pronounced, holding a woman in um, the confines of less than this. But And then by the 1890s, all of the under cages and crinolines and such go away. And the course that changes a woman's body from a an hourglass to kind of an S curve, an S curve, but it's still very much under there, creating the shape of a proper woman. So what are we talking here? 1860s, the hourglass um, figure. Here's that S shape corset from the end of the 19th century. And here, take a look at that waist. <sighs> So if this is what's going on on the outside of a woman's body, what's going on on the inside? Here we have it. Where in the world is she going to put her liver? One man said when he saw a very tightly bound woman. Of course, she's beautiful, but where are her insides? Some women even had lower ribs removed so that they could put that waist smaller and smaller because it was believed that the size of a woman's waist reflected on her family's prestige, their, their, um, their wealth or their position in society. And you can imagine then why women weren't healthy and why doctors had been saying forever to get rid of the corset. The 1870s here, these women, of course, they're pursuing something a little unfeminine by going out and shooting a few targets perhaps, but still they are quite bound up by the 1880s, things get a little looser. In the 1910s, think the Titanic era, think what was happening. And then of course, by the, by the 20s, you've got the roaring 20s and the flappers and everything has been thrown out for, in terms of what's underneath. But think about that as the story of women going from restriction to freedom. And that is a metaphor for what's happening. So not only was this an external revolution? It was an, a, a revolution in society and rights and equality, but an internal one. I don't know that probably there are many of us who haven't had moments like this where we really believe something different about ourselves, but aren't quite sure if that's going to be able to come out. And that revolution goes on every day for every woman and man, I would say. We all have those moments where we want to know, how do we show up? How do we, how do we participate in our world, in our family, in our jobs? How do we participate as the most authentic person we can be? And that's what these women were clinging to. It was tentative in the beginning, but they kept persisting. The point is they persisted and they didn't give up in the face of whatever came at them. All right, so stop sharing for just a minute. Dressed, however, 
by 1861, the Civil War comes about and all those abolitionist women who had been working uh, for not only the right to vote, but the, the um, end of slavery, decided to put aside their ideas about voting in order to support the, the, um, the North cause, the, the cause of freedom and equality, getting rid of slavery. And for four years, they, they did everything they could to support what was happening. And then at the end of the Civil War, indeed, slavery was declared to be over. But then we get a, a chapter in our history that really lays the groundwork for much of what we're experiencing today. And it's important history, but it's difficult in some ways to look at. And some of the quotes that I will share are difficult for me to even speak, but it is what was happening at the time. So we shall go back here. The 13th Amendment was ratified, which means by the time it's passed and ratified, it's ready to become part of the Constitution. In December of 1865, abolished slavery, but that's about all it did. It didn't lay out any, any um, ideas for what an interracial society was going to look like. Four million people are now newly freed. What were they going to do? Could they, could they um, be part of society? I mean, how are we going to change everything? But the 13th Amendment stood alone and um, needed to be, needed more. So the 14th Amendment comes along three years later and it defines the protections of US citizenship and also defines a citizen as being male. So for the first time in the constitution, the word male is used. This incensed the suffragists. They just had no place to put this because now men can vote, any man, black men, immigrant men, um, convicts, I mean, you name it, they, they could vote and this was, they thought this is not gonna work for us. So they, they um, formed the American Equal Rights Association in 1868 for the purpose to secure equal rights for all American citizens, especially the right to suffrage, irrespective of race, color, or sex. They knew another amendment was coming, even though citizens can vote and a citizen was male, they knew another amendment was coming so that it could strictly define who could vote. And so they worked like crazy. Stanton and Anthony were lobbying in Congress. They just did everything they could so that that 15th amendment would read that citizens can vote regardless of sex. But when the 15th amendment was passed, the right of citizens in the U.S. to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the U.S. or any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. And that's where the problems started. Anybody who is a man, no matter what he is, can vote. But not educated white women. Um, think of the lower orders of men who cannot read the Declaration of Independence or Webster's spelling book, making laws for the daughters of Adams and Jefferson. Shall American statesmen so amend their constitution as to make their wives and mothers the political inferiors of the unlettered and unwashed ditch diggers fresh from the plantations of the sap? Racism has now entered the fray of this whole idea of who can vote. Ignorant immigrants, uneducated black men, con convicts, imbeciles can vote, but not white women. Now, Stanton and Anthony said, that's it. We are going to fight for a federal amendment. But Lucy Stone and the others said, well, you know, at least the 15th Amendment is something stop this for a moment. They split American Suffrage Association, National Suffrage Association, and they tried to go forward separately, fighting and using this 
very uncomfortable language, but at the time it was making a point. How can you, how can you allow these other situations to be the case and not include women? And for a couple of decades, nothing much really happened. They didn't get very far. Women were campaigning state by state. The only state that even came a little bit close was Colorado. And Susan B. Anthony herself visited Colorado, um, hoping to see that state include uh, women, but it didn't pass. That was in the 1870s. Um, but by the 1890s, things begin to loosen up and change because now we've been at this for 40 years and a lot of things were beginning to happen. Um, the suffrage groups uh, combined and in the West, Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, and Idaho passed women's suffrage. By 1896, four states in the West allowed women to vote. Two suffrage groups were united Go back to a couple of pictures here. Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton had gotten quite elderly by this time. So they turned over the reins of now National American Women's Suffrage Association, the big organization, to Carrie Chapman Catt and Dr. Anna Shaw, both of them outstanding speakers, outstanding organizers. Um, Carrie Catt was actually called the general. You might be able to see by this, she probably was a little formidable when it came to sticking up for what she wanted. The groups, however, uh, were not um, integrated. So a number of black women leaders came forward. Mary Church Terrell and Ida B. Wells. Um, they had friends in the South uh, who were being lynched. They really brought a lot of focus to the idea that uh, organized, institutionalized segregation in the South, mob violence was prevalent in the Jim Crow states, which had been allowed to rise and flourish. The beginning of the 20th century was also the rise of women's clubs of all kinds, and Black women had to have their own. Um, uh, clubs about um, literature and science politics, charities. Women said, if you aren't going to let us really participate in society, we're going to have our own movement to be part of the culture, be out there. And they did a lot of um, proving that women can organize and are very good at campaigning for what they want. And so these women's clubs, black and white, helped to shore up the movement at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, Let's look at some of the propaganda before we do that. These women at this time were called new women. It was actually the new woman was what they were called. In some states, they could vote. Many places, they could own property. Educational ideas were being opened to them, careers. Um, a lot of women were choosing not to get married and have families, there's just more choice, more freedom. And one of the inventions that had been around for a while that really changed things for women was the bicycle, the bicycle. All that idea about getting rid of those corsets and petticoats and panelettes and getting out there and exercising. Exercise gives women an energy and an endurance and a dexterity and a presence of mind that cannot be overestimated as a sedative for nervous irritability and relief from hypochondria brought on by a sedentary life. Move it, sister, and you will feel so much better. Not only did exercise start to come into play, but look at these women, they can get on their bicycle and they can go somewhere by themselves the independence that was afforded by the bicycle. You could jump on your bicycle and go visit a friend. You didn't have to wait for someone else to take you there. And of course, the bicycle was thought to be an instrument of the devil. It was going to ruin society because the freedom that women were beginning to have on all these little levels was a threat to the status quo. Now, 
Let's look at some propaganda. Remember, print is the only medium. Give women the vote and let mothers protect their children. With all of those various sorts of men um, voting, alcoholism was a big, big problem. And a lot of homes were destroyed by alcohol. And so without the vote, women couldn't, couldn't uh, help to make laws to protect families and protect the children. And this was one big point that they made. The hand that rocks the cradle or the hand that pours the whiskey? Which one is fit for the ballot? And no vote means no remedy for long hours and short pay. Labor groups got involved in fighting for suffrage as well. And of course, there was the other side of the coin. Once I get my liberty, no more wedding bells for me. Women's suffrage passing was going to destroy the family. Men would be wearing skirts and taking care of children. And that's, did we want a society like that? You may do the voting, but I am the boss. The sort of stereotypical battle axe woman is going to take over. I just love this one. Votes for women, yes, you bet. That good time will reach us yet. When men folks know how housework feels, we'll have Campbell's soup at all our meals. And then some higher order um, ideas. Roosevelt's president. Let the people rule. We're the people. And we're the animals. And we're what? And a founding father asking, did I save my country for this? And New York State was a powerful state. And as suffrage was continually defeated in New York State, this piece, you know, this is definitely a new woman uh, by her dress and her hair cut and such, but um, yeah, you're probably never going to have the vote, girl. Something new was needed, and it came in the form of uh, Harriet Stanton Blatch, the daughter of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Alice Paul. They brought some new energy into this. Yes, Kat and Shaw were doing some great stuff, but these young women, they had worked in England with the suffragists there and the suffragists in England were a whole lot more militant. So they came back with some ideas. They said, look, we got to get out there. You can't just go to little tea parties and talk about suffrage. You got to be out there. Have rallies, have parades, um, go to have booths at every uh, outdoor event that you can find. Paul went one step further and organized the suffrage parade in Washington, D.C. in March of 1913, the day before President-elect Woodrow Wilson was to arrive for his inauguration. They had asked the, um, the police in Washington, D.C. to please provide extra, you know, extra officers for this. They knew a lot of people would come. They had no idea, 8,000 participants, groups, bands, floats, um, working women, nurses, mothers, factory women. 8,000 participants and over a half a million um, uh, uh, by uh, people on the sidewalk, uh, viewers of this. And they didn't get any more officers. As the parade went on, and the crowds got more and more intense because this is, of course, representing something that a lot of people didn't want that change to occur. The women, the crowd started to um, pressure the people who were marching. And then, of course, there were, there were riots. The women were beaten. They were tripped and spit upon and no one was arrested. The, um, the chief of police in Washington, D.C. eventually lost his job but it brought so much attention to the idea, this is no longer just a, a sideline for women that we can brush aside. This is really important to them. World War I comes along in 1914. And while we didn't enter it until 1917, women immediately 
jumped on the cause, both sides, the ones who wanted suffrage and the ones who didn't, using it as a, a way to prove that they could be part of the culture. This, um, this woman's journal, this woman is pointing out all the things that women are doing. They are rolling bandages, they're working as telegraphers, telephone operators, munitions um, work, ambulance drivers. This is why we deserve to be citizens. And the ones on the other side said, well, we can do the same things without the vote. This group of women were, uh, were doctors. America didn't want to have women doctors in their course, so they went to France. And the French were very grateful for all the work that American women did during the war. Of course, 1916, Jeanette Rankin was elected to Congress from Montana. And... That was thought to be an impossibility, but Montanans had believed in what she believed in. Kind of fly into the end here. By 1917, when the war, we were really participating in that war. And as a Montana note, here's Hazel Humpkins, our own very own Montanan picketing the White House. People thought these women were horrible. These are traitors. We're at war for crying out loud. They shouldn't be focusing on the, on the vote. But, but the point is, President Wilson had asked Congress to vote for the war. He said, we will, uh, we will vote, we will fight for the things that we always fight for in this country. The right of those who have no voice in their government to be free. He was saying that about the Germans. The women said, hey, wait a minute, 20 million American women are not free. They don't have a voice in their government. When are you gonna fight for them? And so he had to drive his car past these women every day on his way to work. They weren't bothering anyone except for the fact that they were standing there 24 seven. They were arrested for uh, obstructing traffic and thrown into jail. They were treated horribly, put into hard labor conditions, um, poor maggot infested food. They were beaten at night, force fed when they went on a hunger strike. And then this kind of word got out to the public. And then there was no stopping suffrage at that point. The president could no longer look away. And so in January of 19... 18, the question of women's suffrage came to the floor of Congress. It passed in the House in January of 1918, but it would be two years and four votes before it would pass in the Senate. And then in August of 1920, the 19th Amendment, granting women the right to vote, was added to the Constitution in the same wording that Susan B. Anthony proposed 45 years earlier. This passing of the 19th Amendment and ratification, I should say, that was really what allowed it to be added to the Constitution, was just the beginning. Um, it didn't mean that all women could vote. Um, American Indian women were not even considered citizens until this, um, the Citizenship Act recognizing them in 1924. And Asian women was 1948, before they were included in being recognized as women. Of course, voting was easy to suppress in places where you didn't want people to vote. There was no protection until 1965, the Voting Rights Act. And so, as we all know, having just come through 2020 and in a world in this country right now of the continued conversation about who can vote, we're still navigating that. Um, what is equality? What, what does it mean to us in society today? And how are we going to see that going forward? Um, I would love if there's some questions coming up into the chat uh, to, in, to have some questions from you. But I also wanted to point a couple things out. I do a program on Jeanette Rankin. 
And when I started to do the program, you know, Jeanette Rankin famously said, women are half the people, they should be half the Congress. And she said that in 1916, when 1914, when she decided to run for Congress, she said, there's no women in Congress, but they should be half of the people in there. And when I started doing this program about Rankin in 2003, women were 11% of the Congress. So that was just under 20 years ago. Today, just under 20 years later, we've gone from 11% to 25%. That's huge. It took 100 years practically to get to, um, to get to 11%. And then now we're almost at a quarter of the Congress as women, and it's going to keep growing. So there are strides being made um, in terms of voting, but I'll go back to the idea of how do we see ourselves? You know, there's our external world that's, that's navigating a lot right now between the politics and the pandemic and all of the challenges that are before us, but there's the internal world of who are we and how do we show up and how do we wish we could show up and what kind of courage would it take to persist? The women who worked for the 19th Amendment knew early on they were never going to live to see it succeed. But they kept working for a future they knew they weren't going to be here for. How do we see ourselves working for a future that we might not be here for, but we know will make a better world? All right. All right. Mary Jane, can you hear me? I can. Good. Excellent. Um, I don't know if we have anything coming in on chat, but I have a couple questions for you. Yep. Uh, could you expand a little more on the, uh, the, I don't know if it's the polarization between women uh, focusing on states' rights versus women fighting for the federal suffrage uh, for the, uh, you know, constitutional rights. It seems like that, that played into, you know, the women's women writing, fighting for women's vote didn't all line up together. You know, some no. had different approaches. Could you talk a little more about that, that conflict between states' rights and the federal? Well, initially, uh, I believe, um, they, they thought a, a federal amendment would be something they could just uh, propose and work for, but it because because the Constitution didn't say women couldn't vote or women can vote. It didn't say anything about it. States is where that re, that resided, um, and of course the federal government and the hands off states have the ability to make their own rules about some things, and suffrage was one of them. So that pushed women back into going state by state, just organizing within each state. And when Colorado was the first state to vote, to give women the right to vote, Wyoming uh, makes that claim as the first state and it was, but that was grandfathered in on their constitution. So the state legislature used this, um, used this point within their own states to, to um, position themselves even for statehood. I mean, that was the thing. Wyoming said, um, we'd like to include women as citizens so we have more of a population. And that was one of the arguments. So it was really petty and small at the state level. But um, just like anything, look at, uh, look at the cannabis today, state by state. Um, it's just too big of an idea, perhaps, for the federal government to take on. But state by state, they, those were things that could be achieved. And as the states started to succeed in giving women suffrage, that, that helped the movement grow. Wouldn't it have been great if the Congress had just sat down and said, yeah, we should have included them long ago, but they didn't. So, so succeeding state by state, I think, was part of the big process of showing success, showing that some Americans really thought this was a good idea. And I think you're right. I mean, uh, when, once you start developing momentum state by state, and, you know, I, I think you mentioned uh, uh, 
Alice Paul, um, they, they understood that if they had all those women from the Western states who had already been voting, that people could see that like, they're okay. The world <laughs> hadn't fallen apart, you know? The world isn't. So, and guess okay. what? There's a whole lot of great laws that women care about. You know, that's what got, got Rankin into the whole thing to begin with. She said, if you're going to make laws to protect children, to, to um, have fair labor and all these things, things that affect the family and the community, you've got to have people voting who care about that stuff. People with foreign policy issues and all this, there's plenty of men to take care of that. Who, can, who takes care of the family? And so the whole idea that we have more um, laws about our communities and domestic ideas is because women got their voices in there. Well, the, the second question I have, I don't, I don't know how you could answer this, um, but, but it's, it strikes me, you know, when you look at the people who are in opposition to suffrage, you mentioned a bicycle uh, as being an instrument of the devil. I love that from my friends out there at Trailnet here in Billings. Um, you know, but also the women in opposition to suffrage mentioned, as you mentioned, the destruction of the American family, uh, you know, the dangers of socialism. They used all of those terms uh, to say women shouldn't get the right to vote because the world would collapse and fall apart. Um, it strikes me as a very universal thing that we do. You know, if something looks a little different, you, you strike out with, with caution, maybe initially, and then fear. How, how did the, once the vote came in, how did people address the idea that, wow, the world didn't fall apart? That's an interesting uh, question. Because you, because looking at the anti-suffragists, they, they were staunch anti-suffragists. They did not believe this is something women should do. Politics was a foul, disgusting, who, what woman, uh, what proper woman would want to go to the polls where all the men are smoking cigars and they've been drunk since 6 a.m. down at the precinct? I mean, that was the whole idea. It's dangerous for women to vote. If women can vote, they will by extension, be aligning themselves with political parties. And, and that was going to be wrong because once you start aligning yourself with political parties, then people, um, let's see, are, I've got funny stuff happening on my screen. Is that, yeah, that, that would be a mistake, actually. Okay. Okay. Um, Aligning yourself with a political party then gives you, you're a for or against kind of a person. If women aren't involved in politics, then they can't be seen as for or against anything. They can just go about their business. So that was one of, and then also the idea that women, who's going to raise the children if women are out working? And they thought like overnight, women would just defect from the things that they're good at and that they love, which is their family. So there were all those extreme ideas of what would happen once women could vote. And kind of, I think it, at once the 19th Amendment, there was such a, a crescendo to getting it passed. And once it was passed, it was kind of a non-event. Nothing changed. Overnight, women didn't stampede out of the home. Children weren't left in the streets overnight. All these things that were dire uh, consequences of suffrage didn't happen. So I think it kind of, um, I think it just kind of was like a big, huge whitewater thing that just kind of walked, went out into a pool. And there were other things to think about. Think of the beginning of the twenties. Um, the whole idea that women would only vote the way their husbands told them to vote. Why have them vote when you're only going to get like double the votes because they won't, they don't know how to vote. And that was a thing. The National American Women's Suffrage Association uh, formed the League of Women Voters the minute it was passed because, you know, it's a tool. Alice Paul said it's a tool. We've got to know how to use it. You can't just vote the way someone tells you. You need to look at the issues and uh, pay attention and be on your own. And for many women, that was a new, a new um, 
way to be. They've been raised for centuries to only be second, second in line for thinking, second class citizens, if you will, that you don't really have a voice. Having a voice is a huge thing. Today, having a voice is a big thing. Um, the third question I had, I'm sorry about the screen. I'm not sure what happened, but um, um, the women get the right to vote 1920. You mentioned 1924, 1948. Um, it's been 100 years. Uh, women are represented at the highest levels of government now, clearly. Uh, so much has uh, obviously gotten better and improved. Um, but still only about 20% uh, or so women are represented in government. It seems like it takes a long time to get to that point. And what are your thoughts on that? I have always said that we're six inches away from whatever it is we want to have happen. Six inches is all the farther away we are. And it's the six inches between people's ears. You have to change minds in order to change anything else. People have to open their minds and their hearts. Um, so, yeah, it's taken a long time. It, it is... In 2013, when I was first um, coming to Montana, there was a symposium celebrating Angelina Grimke's speech to the Massachusetts legislature. It was, what would that have been, 1838 or something, 150th anniversary or something. And uh, um, Gloria Steinem was there. There were some young women in politics. Um, and they were talking about what it's like. There's... Uh, tremendous prejudice against women. You know, I think of the first women who went to um, to medical school and, you know, they would sabotage their, their projects. Men would sabotage their projects or they put the guts from a dissection in their locker or, you know, just terrible things that they did to, to demean the women who were trying something new. And in politics, these young women were talking about, you know, they, they have meetings and forget to tell you that when the meeting is, or they um, spill coffee on your papers just as you're about to speak. I mean, it sounds very childish, but they were giving anecdotes of what it's like to be in politics. You really have to be strong. So it's taken a while for women to get to that point. Look at when Clinton ran, um, she had like a little stain or something on her suit and that's what got press or, I don't know, something about her socks or her hair. That's what got the press, not her issues. I and mean, I can think of some pretty scrungy looking men in politics who come out and speak and nobody talks about their clothes or their hair. So, you know, we have to make, we have to make strides and get rid of the small stuff that continues to inform us. And a lot of that maybe has changed in the last five years. I hope so. I'm not interested in being in politics. I have other things that I'm interested in. But along the way, it's those, I, there's still so many brave women taking a stand on all of the issues today that I, I have the utmost respect for and am so happy that they're willing to do the work. That's great. Thank you. I mean, and, and I think it is very recent. I mean, if you look at like your own personal family, you can go through, you know, in my own, in my own instance, my mom ran a newspaper in New York, probably one of the first. My sister-in-law was the second graduate in medical school in Virginia. You know, my daughter is an engineer. They, they're usually like outnumbered, you know, 20 to one. And uh, so it does take a long time, um, but there's a lot of hope that uh, fairness can, can come into light too, so. I always think of it as the new, each new generation of women is raising young women and raising young men to be different than they have in the past. And it's not to, you know, people in the past did the best they could and they were going by status quo in many cases. They, who wants to rock the boat? Who wants to be the one that rocks the boat? But each new generation, I see it in how my daughter was in school and her friends and her associations with her her 
male friends and her female friends who were very different than when I went to school. And that was um, 25 years ago. And then now when I look at my neighborhood children and overhear their conversations when they're, you know, outside and such, it's different. So each succeeding generation is going to make it easier for there to be inclusion and, and um, equality going forward, I believe. I believe we have to believe the very best of what we are. And I think that's what's going to happen. I, I agree. So th thank you so much again. Thanks for Humanities Montana. All glitches are on my end. Uh, so that's very important to know. Uh, Mary Jane is a, uh, the ultimate professional and uh, I may get scolded on this one because of something I did. I have no idea, but I hope that uh, our listeners are out there and uh, Community 7 is recorded this so they can share it uh, later on and uh, hope uh, uh, it's such an incredible topic and something that everyone, everyone in this country should know this story, you know, and you, and I felt you dealt very well with the racial aspects and particular with the 15th amendment, which often we like to gloss over those kind of moments. And, uh, but that really is the reality of that uh, period um, in the women's struggle to get the right to vote. So. Um, I will send uh, viewers and listeners to two really, really well done uh, productions, video productions, and they're on Netflix. One of them is called Amend, and that is about the 15th Amendment. And then there's one called 13, and it's about the 13th Amendment. That was a critical amendment and speaks to the tremendous racial inequality of today, which grew out of the language in those amendments. And to this day in court cases, those three amendments are continually brought up. Who is a citizen? Who can vote? And they're used for or against whatever argument you're, you're standing by. So, so very, very well done history um, productions on those two, on, of those two. So amend and 13. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope everyone enjoys the uh, fall weather coming our way for the next few yes. weeks. And, we uh, deserve it. We deserve it. We had a rough summer. We, we deserve yeah, it. We absolutely. Fall. So, and uh, continue to be safe out there. So, thanks again, Mary Jane. We'll see yes, you. You're welcome. Thank you. You bet.